Hi, I'm James Robinson, and this is my stock pick of the week. This is the fifth video in our series on Cisco, symbol CSCO. But before I do that, and before I talk about this video, I want to talk a little bit about the market. I'm going to talk later about how I'm up uh, 7% uh, roughly for the year, uh, <clears throat> which is fantastic, right? I'm really proud of that. I'm finally beating the S&P 500. In fact, I'm beating the S&P 500 by about, um, by about 7% because the S&P 500 is about even the day I'm making this video. But um, I'm not comfortable with that. I think that the market is very much overbought. I don't think the economy is where it was January 1, and I don't think stocks or my portfolio should be 7% higher than it was um, January 1. I think that uh, we've done, we've had a tremendous amount of bailouts, a tremendous amount of, uh, not bailouts, but uh, support from the federal government. And I think, by the way, the PPP program has been very well done very well received, it's been very fair in that it gave businesses money which they could use to buy productivity and thus pay employees. So the employees got money and the businesses got productivity. Uh, I think it was well done and it, it has certainly benefited my business. But that money's running out and the economy is not in good shape. Uh, I'm What I do for a living is commercial real estate. So I represent lots of different clients in lots of different industries and also have a client base of 30 years of people in industries. And people talk to me very frankly um, because I've built relationships with them over the years. And I'm not hearing stories that everything's business as usual. Um, I represent a company who is in equipment rental business. I'm sorry, I, re I have a buddy who's in an equipment rental business. And he tells me his, you know, he's been in that company for a as a salesman for you know, more than a decade. And he tells me he's not allowed to travel. His company won't let him travel. When a great, good salesman with a good record wants to travel for business, they usually would let him go, and they won't. Um, I have clients who are not doing deals because they want to see what's going to happen with the economy. I know the real estate economy has been devastated. Uh, residential, probably not so much, uh, but office buildings, people are going to start working from home to some degree. When the PPP money runs out, people are going to stop paying rent. Uh, and businesses are going to shut down. I don't think it's going to be wholesale, but 5 or 10%. I think people are going to expand the amount they work from home, which is going to hurt the real estate industry. Retail has been killed. Restaurants have been slaughtered. Um, and so I, I put all that together and I say, this is not a great time to be buying new positions in stocks. I think it's a time to, to hold your powder. I, I have, for the first time in my investing career, put a trailing stop loss on every position in my portfolio except for three or four. Um, a trailing stop loss, for those of you who don't know how that works, um, you basically say, if the stock goes up, I'll continue to own it. If the stock stays the same, I'll continue to own it. But if the stock drops by some amount um, from whatever the peak is, then I have an automatic sell position put in. So for example, if a company is trading at $50 a share and you have a $2 stop loss, if it goes to 48, you would sell. However, if it goes up the next day to 51, then a $2 loss means you would sell at 49. So it's a way of saying, I think the market's in trouble. Uh, I'm, I'm not easy, I'm not comfortable with the market, but I recognize that there's sort of some irrational exuberance. So I'll ride it as long as it goes up, and I think that's a matter of weeks or days. Um, but at that point, I expect that, you know, the market's gonna soften quite a bit. I'm gonna hit my, my numbers, and I'm gonna sell out of virtually every position that I have. Um, that's a really extreme position to take, but again, I just think we're gonna be in for a longer recovery than people think. So having said that, I've started this thing on what, this thing on Cisco. I do think Cisco is a good long-term buy, and if you're looking to buy and hold a company for 10 years, Cisco is a good one. Uh, I don't know how much Cisco will go down, so I'm going to continue to do this video. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, let everybody know that I'm not, you know, in love with the stock market right now. Also, before I go any further, um, here's a map of the world, and the blue dots on the map represent my known subscribers. I don't, I'm not making any money off this and it's not gonna make, I'm not gonna make any money off it anytime soon, but I really do get a kick out of knowing that there's people following me in Australia and South Korea and Kuala Lumpur and Dubai and all the other places people are from. So if you're following me, whether it's, you know, in America or, you know, some far flung continent, uh, please just uh, take a minute, write in the comments below, you know, I'm from, you know, Santiago, Chile or wherever you're from. Um, especially if you're from Africa, because the only place I don't have subscribers right now, the only continent I don't have subscribers is Africa. So if you're following me in some place in Africa, I'd love to hear about it because then I get to put a dot there and there's a blank spot on my map. Thanks.
I always start the video on wealth creation by looking at shares outstanding. Uh, a company will buy back shares as a way of enriching their shareholders. When they do that, it just means that if you used to own 10% of the company and they buy back 10% of the stock, you would now own 11% of the company. So you'd get a larger share of the earnings. You should get a larger share of the dividends and the value of your stock should go up that much. And the, ben the beauty of all that is it's a tax-free event to you. If the company pays you dividends, you have to pay taxes on it. But if they don't pay you dividends, if they do this, then you don't pay taxes. So every year or virtually every year since 2002, this company has bought back shares. If you look at it in 2018 and 19, um, those, that seems to be an accelerating uh, deal. And therefore, we love the way this company is pay buying back stocks. Um, absolutely, not only, there's nothing to complain about, but it's, it's very excellent. So if you look at it another way, if you owned 10% uh, of Cisco at the end of 2009, you would have owned about 582 million shares. Today, through stock repurchases, your 582 million shares would mean your ownership in the company has increased from just over 10, from 10% to just over 13%. So that's a 31% increase. So without doing anything, you've got 31. You own 30, a 31% larger share of the business, just by virtue of the just by virtue of the fact that you held it. And by the way, during that time, the company did pay you dividends. Um, um, looked at another way, your share of the company's earnings would have gone from $776 million to $1.5 billion over those 10 years. So that's those earnings have gone from $1.33 per share to $2.63 per share. And again, um, that's again, free money, right? Free profits. The value of your stock is going up every year. So wonderful in terms of uh, well, using uh, share repurchases to enrich the shareholders. So stockholders' equity, this at first might be the kind of thing that really scares an investor because what is happening to stockholders' equity? Um, you can see there was really flat between 2000 and 2006. And between 2006 and 2017, it went up gradually. And then the last two years, it's drew, decreased dramatically. The simple logic here is this company has been buying back shares, has been paying dividends, and has bought an awful lot of, has paid down an awful lot of debt. And when you add all that up, that means there's just less resources in the company's coffers and thus less equity. Um, I don't look at it as a problem. I think you, it could be very easily argued that this company had more equity than they needed, more equity than they could justify, and so they found various ways to return that equity to the shareholders, which can, will only be, boost our return on equity, right? Because we get the same profits, but with less equity. So I have no problem with this at all. I've seen what's happened to the money, uh, and so even though shareholder equity has dropped dramatically, I don't think that I think that that shareholder drop has been more than offset by the value that's been created for the shareholders. Also, it is worth noting that the company only had about $100 million of profit in 2017. And so that would have caused them to use some resources to pay the bills that year. And again, the income since then has rebounded nicely to where, where it used to be. So it was just a blip on the radar and not necessarily um, indicative of what was happening in the business. The next thing that um, I look at is return on assets. The logic here is it takes money to make money, but if it takes too much money to make money, then it's not an efficient use of money. It's not efficient use of the capital. And so what I like to see is that a company is able to generate lots of profits without needing to hold lots of our money to do it. Uh, so this chart looks at uh, return on assets. The red line represents the top 10% of companies in terms of generating return on assets. The green line represents the top 25% of companies. Uh, and then the purple line represents the bottom 25% of companies. So you can see that this company has been in the top 25% and verging on, get coming close to the top 10% of companies uh, so between 2009 and 2018. Obviously, 2018 was a lower year because we've talked that the company only made a, a slight profit that year. Um, so this company at first doesn't appear to be excellent. It appears to be good, but not excellent. And I'd still invest in the company if it was good, but not excellent. But the good news is because this company has been paying down debt, that's reducing their assets. Uh, when you pay down debt, you go from, let's say you had $10 billion in debt and $10, million in, $10 billion in cash. That shows up as $10 billion of assets because we're not talking about equity, we're talking about pure assets. So that shows up as $10 billion of assets even though you have this $10 billion of debt. When you take the $10 billion of assets and you pay off the debt, now you have no debt, but you also have no cash, and so you have no assets. And when you have those no assets, your return on assets obviously goes up dramatically. And that's what's happened here. That's how this company was able to generate and you know, get into the top 10% of return on assets in 2019. I look for that number to continue. I look for the company to continue to do that. Again, this would be maybe offset a little bit by the pandemic, 
But in general, I look at this company as being one who's gonna to continue to generate these really excellent returns on assets, which is another reason why I think this company is primed to continue to create wealth for the shareholders. So when you look at this slide and you look at return on, um, on equity, you'll see that this company is not even in the top 25% of companies in return on equity. Um, but you've gotta look at this a little bit with a jaw in this eye. Um, the company's return on equity has been above 10% every year with the exception of 2018, and that's still pretty good. Um, but the reason that they rank lower relative to other companies is there's an awful lot of companies that are just totally debt laden. And as a result, they have very little equity. And as a result, they get fantastic returns on that equity. They also take a lot of risk. Our company is taking very little risk because they have very little debt, but that reduces their return on equity. And again, if you look at the return on equity for this company, it's always been between, you know, really call it 15 and 20%. In the last year, the return on equity has been spectacular. Um, but that's because when you pay off, when you take cash to pay off debt, you uh, don't change your equity position, right? Because for every dollar of asset and every dollar of debt, there's an offset. So when you pay off debt, when you use cash to pay off debt, you don't change your equity position much, uh, but you're still getting hopefully the bigger profits, especially because one of the things is you're not paying as much interest. So long story short, return on shareholder equity for this company is not excellent. My stocks typically aren't the best in return on equity. They tend to be you know, sort of above average at best. And, this is, and that's sort of the explanation as to why. So retained earnings, just to give you an explanation, when a company generates profits at the end of the year, they have to decide what to do with those profits. And they can do lots of things with it. They can you know, pay it out as dividends, they can pay off debt, they can buy back shares. One of the things they can do is they can invest in the business. And if a company is able to generate good profits, I don't mind if they return money to the business. Um, but what's fascinating about this company is if you, so blue is the retained earnings, the cumulative retained earnings for the company and red is the change in retained earnings. So we'll look at the red number and you can see that in the last two years, this company has not only retained no earnings, but they've actually paid back, you know, call it $20 billion to the shareholders, um, through stock repurchases, through debt reduction, et cetera, et cetera. So the company has had no retained earnings, negative retained earnings, which means, which means they haven't been investing in the business and they've still been able to grow their earnings to $11 billion a year. That is fantastic. Uh, we love a company that, for, that needs no retained earnings and that is returning money to the shareholders so fast. So this is really excellent. It's one of those things that's a little counterintuitive when you look at the slide, but hopefully you get it. So when a company retains earnings, we like to figure out if that company is using those earnings efficiently, is adding to the bottom line as a result of retaining earnings. The nightmare scenario is that the company is retaining a bunch of money in earnings and the earnings never grow, and so effectively that money is falling into a black hole. You're really just treading water or worse, slowly drowning. Um, and so when you look at this company, what I do to figure this out, and I know it's an oversimplification, I talk about it every time, is I say how much retained earnings did the company keep over the last 10 years? And how much did the earnings increase over those same 10 years? And I basically say, let's just assume that the increase in earnings was created 100% by the retained earnings, which I know is an oversimplification. If that, if that were the case, what would the retain on earnings be? What would the retained earnings be? The, sorry, the return on retained earnings be? And if that number is over 10%, then I basically give the company a pass on whatever they're doing on retained earnings, because I assume those earnings are being used efficiently enough that we're generating new bottom, money to the bottom line for every dollar the company retains. Uh, and this company has been above that number virtually every year except for 2017. And so we look at this and say that's fine. And by the way, these numbers were you to continue to look at this chart over the next few years. Might, this might start to be an irrational number because the company is in fact retaining zero earnings and retaining negative earnings because they're they are giving so much back to the shareholders. But for now, we're still able to use that number even though the retained earnings have been zero for the last couple of years because over the 10 year time period, there was a net positive amount of retained earnings. So if that was, hopefully that, that's clear. One of the things a company can do with its earnings is simply hoard it in cash, retain it in cash for a rainy day or for a purchase or whatever to pay you know, increases in current liabilities as the company grows. So you can see this company since, I don't know, 2003 has had an increase in cash and marketable securities as well as, uh, as, well as investments and advances um, all the way up to 2017. But in 2017, this company has dramatically reduced their amount of cash. And again, that's largely in part to the, uh, due to the fact that the company has, has managed to pay back so much debt. 
So I know that this chart looks a little bit like spaghetti, but what you want to focus on is the, uh, this, the orange line. The orange line is the cumulative wealth created for the previous five years. And let me tell you how that's derived. There's, again, we talk about this all the time. There's a number of things a company can do to create wealth for the shareholders. For example, they can pay dividends. So the dividends is the red line. And you see that over every year the company is paying some money in dividends. Uh, they can do a stock buyback. And you, know, you can see this company has generally bought back stock every year to some degree, not tremendously, but a little bit every year. They bought back 30% of the company over the last eight, uh, 10 years, for example. Um, the company can increase cash, which does create value for the business because it reduces risk and it allows the company to maneuver through rough times. Uh, and so a company can do that to retain cash. The company can change debt by reducing debt that enriches the shareholders or by increasing debt, which impoverishes the shareholders. Um, and so when you look at all this, you can see that this company hadn't done a very good job in net wealth creation until about 2010. But from 2010 on, the company has done great. And it's gone from you know negative $18 billion of cumulative wealth creation over the previous five years to almost uh, $20 billion of wealth creation over a five year period. So it's done really, really well. And it's done it through a number of mechanisms, um, you know, paying down debt, paying dividends, buying back stock. And uh, last, but, last but not least, they have, you know, um, they have gone, gone ahead and improved the debt position. So very, very strong company. I can tell you that if I was gonna buy a stock that I wanted to hold for 10 years, Cisco would be one of those stocks that I would probably buy. And I know I started this video by saying that there's a big pandemic and that I think the economy is weaker than it has been in the past. You know, in those two periods of time, you could go to all cash if you want. However, if you also want, you could just buy really great companies when they're on sale and just be grateful that you own them, get some dividends, the company pays a 3% dividend and allow that company to go through the rough times, come back out the other end and make you a lot of money. I don't think you should try and time the market. I think if you find a good company at a good price, you should buy it. And I think this company qualifies. So this is my stock portfolio uh, as of Sunday. Uh, we were up about 7%. Uh, the S&P 500 is up, you know, roughly what, less than 1% uh, up to the year this time, uh, you know, up to this date from the beginning of the year. So for the first time, really, I've outperformed the market. You know, I've, if you watch my videos all this year, I've been trailing the market every month, every month, every video, and it's been getting frustrating. Um, but, you know, I think if you make intelligent decisions and you're patient and you wait, then good things can happen over the long term. And they certainly seem to be now. A large part of this is, is frankly, luck. I mean, my children's place has gone up 217% in a couple of months. My Ventas has gone up 126% in a couple of months. And, you know, I've got um, Medfast, which is up 56%, and Lion del Basel, which is up 40%. You know, it goes on and on and on. You can see these numbers for yourself. Um, MSC Industrial Direct is up 41%. That's really offset a bunch of the stocks that had dropped significantly at the beginning of the, you know, at the, beginning of the pandemic and allowed me to get this return. And having said all that, I'm nervous that these companies have run too quickly, that people are too exuberant, that this thing is over and it's all going to be fine. Whether or not the pandemic is over, I still recognize maybe an open decision, an open question, but its effects, I think, are going to be longer lasting than 60 or 90 days. And I think the market's going to be soft. So don't be surprised if my portfolio doesn't look very different in 60 days than it does today. Um, and, you know, hopefully everybody can, excuse me, can weather this storm and we can all, you know, come out the other end together. Um, finally, uh, if you want to know when I sell stocks, uh, the best way to do that is to follow me on Twitter. I don't always get a chance to make a video. It takes time to do these videos, but whenever I make a trade, I always put it on Twitter uh, and my handle is at Robinson stocks. I also will put real time information on trades and updates, new videos, um, et cetera, et cetera, on Twitter. So that's where you can get real data in real time. Thank you very much for following me and, um, wishing everybody the best, uh, wishing everybody the best of luck. Thanks.